Welcome to Syncreate. This is a show where we explore the intersections between creativity, psychology, and spirituality. We believe everyone has the capacity to be creative. Our goal is to demystify the creative process and expand the boundaries of what it means to be creative. I'm Melinda Rothhaus, and I help individuals and organizations bring their creative dreams and visions to life. So my very special guest today is Dr. Stephen Pritzker. He's the co-editor of the Encyclopedia of Creativity, among many other things. Uh, he was also one of my mentors at Saybrook University, where he continues to teach and was for a long time the head of the Creativity Studies program there. And before that, he was a television writer and wrote for many different shows over the years, including the award-winning Mary Tyler Moore show. So, Dr. Pritzker, very delighted to have you here today. And um, Dr. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you helped me get there. So thanks yeah. to you for that. Um so, wow. Okay. So we were talking leading up to this and kind of one of the themes that that as we were sort of riffing on what we might talk about was this idea of the connection between creativity and synchronicity and how we can really kind of, um, you know, begin to trust the intuitions and the synchronicities that arise and how they can sort of guide our creative process. So you've had this amazing career and you've done so many different things. And I'm curious, you know, just kind of diving into that topic, you were telling me a little bit about how you even got to Hollywood in the first place. But, you know, how has synchronicity played a role in your career and your own creativity? Well, um, I, I'm not sure if it's luck or synchronicity. Synchronicity. <laughs> right. The research on synchronicity is hard. To, it's almost like religion. You almost have to have faith in it right. and believe in it uh, because you can't. It doesn't seem to. The law. Uh, the part that uh, throws me is I'll, I'll say, okay, I ran in this person in some obscure place, and they'll say, yeah, but if you compute the odds and the thing, it's not as rare as you think it is. And I say, well, <laughs> I'm going to stay with my. I think it's a rare thing and go with that. Seemed pretty cool to me, it right? <laughs> yeah. Worked for me. Yeah, yeah so, exactly. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, it's like uh, TV. I I uh, I had a business degree and I, I didn't study writing at all in college. And uh, I was working in the uh, Dick Van Dyke show came on, uh, which was about TV writers. Uh, and it just, I'd never thought about TV writing. I thought, well, you know, that looks like fun. And I've always been kind of a uh, class clown and a little funny. So maybe I can do that. But it also helped that my mother had uh, two friends and another acquaintance that all had gone to Hollywood and become successful comedy writers in New York and then Hollywood. So I had someone. When I got the idea, I had someone to send the script to, and um, half a script. I couldn't even do a whole script. <laughs> right. And uh, and who could tell me, you know, I just said, tell me, you think I can do this or not? And he said, yeah. And then uh, he was a producer of the Andy Griffith Show. And he he never gave me an assignment, which I sort of would have really <laughs> appreciated, but he did give me the confidence and he uh, told an agent about me and, you know, that never led to anything directly, but the, the coincidence or synchronicity or whatever I, you want to call it was that my mother had this, you know, uh, these friends. And so I had a model in my head, you go to Hollywood and you just do it, you know, right. it wasn't like, when I got there, I realized there's like thousands of people there trying to do the same thing I am. And that was a little bit yeah. discouraging. But I love that it just, you know, it, it was a possibility for you. You know, it opened up a possibility yeah. in your mind, like this is a thing that people do and it can be done. 
Yeah, I, and it, it didn't hurt that I, I had been working for a company uh, for a couple of years in the food industry, and and I wanted to be in advertising, and I I, I couldn't get an a- agency. Jobs were really hard. And I got one at a client, and I, I really saw what advertising was, mm-hmm. and I had had the glamorous Mad Men yeah. vision. And it turned, Mad Men actually was a, probably a closer thing. I I never worked for an agency, but I just saw I saw a guy who was a model of who I wanted to be, uh, who got canned, you know, <laughs> right? For reasons that I I couldn't find clearly, uh, other than he did something somebody didn't like. Um, so I just kind of knocked the um, the glamour or the vision of what what advertising is and what it could be uh, out of my head. And so I I felt uh, doing TV that was, I could be proud of would be a better, a better thing. Now it didn't make sense in a lot of ways. And, and some of these decisions never do. Right. They have to be done on some kind of gut, feeling yes. and a thou- uh, tens of thousands of people have them and a lot of them don't work out but I applaud each person that followed it and I don't think I, I've never talked to anyone who regretted it because they took a shot at something they wanted Yes, and that in itself is uh, an accomplishment of sorts yeah know? I mean you got to show up right in order yeah. for something yeah, to you happen gotta go. Yeah, you know it won't. Uh, it won't happen just, you know, uh, out of the blue. I, there are occasions, I guess, with actors that have been, you know, discovered On or whatever. That, or but something. you don't know the truth. You don't know the truth of those stories. One thing I found out about Hollywood is, it's uh, it is all a myth. Yes. Hollywood. Yes. All a lie. Yeah. It's a beautiful lie we all want to believe. Yes. But so how did you land your first break, your first TV writing Uh, gig? Well, again, you know, uh, I have to say it was through a friend of my mother's in Chicago who had a nephew who worked at William Morris. And uh, it wasn't, I had another agent before that. But uh, I, I got, when I got a chance, William Morris used to be the biggest agency. And that's who you wanted to be with, yeah. theoretically. And um, he uh, was a junior agent there, but he liked my stuff. And uh, he sent it to uh, um, somebody who had done a, a show called Laugh-In, which was, was number one at the time. Mm-hmm. And this guy really liked my stuff. Now, this wasn't the kind of writing I wanted to do. Yeah, I wanted to do sitcoms, but people, these were jokes, and yeah, <laughs> I just wrote them. How random is that? And then he ended up loving them and hiring me and doing uh, a lot of. I did uh, some shows with him because I just landed a job. I was almost out of money. I, mean, I was really, right, really, and I had gotten a job, you know, at a hard riff. I mean, it was, <laughs> we course. couldn't, I was going to do the advertising marketing yeah. and a hardware. It made doorknobs. I mean, there couldn't be anything <laughs> more depressing. They were very pretty doorknobs. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure. It wasn't, I mean, <laughs> beauty could only carry itself so far. <laughs> and my office, right off the factory where they were making these, doors, I'd open the door. And go, well, <laughs> it was like in the city of industry. It was like my nightmare. Yeah. And then this came along, and after three weeks, the guy who hired me was so nice. And I said, you know, I went through a whole hiring process. He took me out to dinner, and and you gave me a good salary compared to what I was making. And I I got this offer, and he said, no, you got to take it. Go. And, and so, you know, you run across people, you go, God, that guy was nice. Yeah. And more. Uh, so I, this guy, a guy was named Digby Wolf, and he was a head writer on Laughing. So he had a spinoff that he was going to do. So a spinoff in the number one show, you're thinking, 
this is may not be what I want to do, but it's going to get me some. Right. So we did some specials. He had some specials. So the first show I had my name on was a Tennessee Ernie Ford special. But the guests were like Jack Benny, Lucille Ball, uh, Andy Griffith. Amazing. So I was like, I I was just behind stage looking at these people. Oh, my God. This is awesome. It doesn't matter that, you know, what it was. So we did a couple. We did a pilot. And we did, then we did this show. And uh, it was uh, produced by George Slaughter, who didn't laugh in. And the whole idea was life is speeding up. Mm-hmm. This is in the uh, late 60s, around 1970 or something. A long, long time. And it can just continues and, uh, to speed up. <laughs> yeah. But the idea was a quick clips and and um the the staff uh the writing staff that digby had hired had some amazing amazing people on it people went on to do uh all in the family and albert albert brooks was he was like 19 or something we were uh, uh there were you know it was great great people a guy that went on Many of them went on to very successful careers. So we had all done this writing, and then we got the first show, and the first show was we hated it, mm-hmm. and the staff, and uh, we spoke up. They said, "You speak up." I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> "You be the one." <laughs> I the youngest, next to Albert, and I'm like, "Well." You know, because this was only three years after I got to Hollywood. Yeah. With no experience and a year I burned. So I'm like, well, geez, I don't know. All right. Okay. I'll, I'll just say what we feel. Yeah. We we hate the show. <laughs> <laughs> How'd that go over? <laughs> I said, well, that's the show. Yeah. You know, and it, was, yeah, it, it was very political. It was mm. very, very liberal. And to the extent that we, we didn't feel it was pop television anymore. It was, yeah. it was a more preaching kind of thing. So it went on the air, and uh, it it was the biggest bomb that ever hit the oh, air. Oh no! The biggest bomb within within um, it was canceled by Tuesday. I swear to you, the whole show we had already wow. shot seven or eight. And it was canceled. We had better shows. We we gave you better material. Why did you? (laughs) Well, that material is you know gone, and people didn't like the concept. It was probably seem slow now or not that fast, Mm. but for the time it was very fast. But they hated the political stuff, Mm. and they were calling up and and I'm I'm driving home on Sunday from a thing, and I. One of the guys was on the radio. One of the writers was on the radio, and he said, "You know, I'm on this show, and it got canceled." <laughs> I'm going, oh, oh my no! <laughs> Back to square one. Only worse. I mean, I got the worst credit anybody ever had mm. at that time. I think it was the first show that had been canceled after one episode. So really? it really wow. It had That's that. a dubious <laughs> distinction. <laughs> it is. It's a dubious Hall of Fame. Right? <laughs> yeah. So that would be a good Hall of Fame. Yeah. I like that one. Exactly. Uh, so so I'm broke. I've got a terrible credit. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And uh, uh, something happened with my folks that was terrible. And I had to send them what money I had. So I'm down to like, I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent. And um, William Morris, the guy William Morris called. And he said, uh, they're having a, um, you can, you can go to that girl and get a, uh, if they like you, they'll let you write a script. You'll, you'll get minimum. You won't get what normal writers get, but it's a deal with the writer's guilt. So they want to give that to someone. So go over there and see if you can get that. So I went over there. I was so nervous because, you know. You know, I'm, I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to be on the street in a, mm-hmm. a month. And uh, I uh, um, I got lucky because a guy there in the room really, 
either related to me in some way, saw himself in me, and he said, don't worry, you got it. I'm, and and I did the script, and the guys that produced it, they told me, you have to do it in a week. You turn it in in two, or two weeks. Uh, and there was no hurry. I mean, it was spring. Yeah. They were just doing that. I don't know why they did it, but uh, it taught me to write quickly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I had to write quickly. Nothing and, like a deadline. And actually, the living, you have to write pretty quickly at that. So they they liked the script. It was a story they had come up with, and they, they liked it. And they gave it to Marlo Thomas, who was the star of the show, and she hated it. Oh, so no. I went, oh, no. <laughs> Here we this go again. Not, <laughs> it's not going well. But they did something really, really kind. These guys, uh, Sal Turtledob and Bernie Orenstein, they sent it to um, two people um, to read. And uh, one of them were, were guys doing a show called Room 222, which was a high school show that was very good. And I wanted to work on that show. And they liked it. And I went over there. I met Jim Brooks, who became Jim Brooks, you know. And uh, uh, Alan Burns, I think, was there at the time, and Gene Reynolds. And they said, fine, do a script. And I went out and did research. And uh, the other guy was Ed Weinberger, who was doing Cosby. And I gave him a story. And he said, uh, we're not going to do that story. So um, I liked your story, but we're not going to do it. But at uh, Room 222, I went and did research with Gene Reynolds at a high school and did a show about uh, somebody uh, who wanted to be a teacher and how difficult it really is to control a classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, and they don't really teach you that in, exactly. in uh, college. So I, I liked it, and they liked it. And it, this is like a Hollywood thing. You talk about, I don't know if it's synchronicity or dumb luck. I, I think, you know, also a lot of it is dumb luck. Yeah. Because who can design this? The story editor La, was leaving, even though the show was picked up, because he wanted to write movies. He had a chance. And they said, uh, we'd like you to be the story editor. Now, I hadn't even had a show on the air yet. Right. My show was on the air. I got credit as my own story editor. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's ever had that happen. That's amazing. And the show, the ratings went up in the spring, and the show got an Emmy for Best New Comedy um, Series. And um, and then I, I left after that year. The other guy came back. It was a temporary position, but... Uh, Jim Brooks and Alan Burns did the Mary Tyler Moore show. And so I went over and they, they, they liked the work I'd done. And, I, and so I got to work there and, and everybody liked the work on Room 222. So I was getting all kinds of offers as far as doing, uh, script writing. And so that, that then established my career. Yeah. So I mean, that, I don't know if that, probably more information than you want about that. But I, I I tell that because I feel there's a series of um, really lucky things that happen there. Sure. That uh, uh, occurred because I I followed through on them. I I I did I did what there I can give you also a series of mistakes. You know, I just think it's interesting, like you were kind of saying, you know, the mistakes along the way, right? I mean, it's not yeah. it's not a linear path, right? We have false starts no. and we have things that don't work. And then we, you know, if we keep showing up, eventually something happens and one maybe. thing leads to maybe. another. That, yeah, but that's the thing. It's maybe. Yeah. There's a lot of people that doesn't. But I never met anyone, Bob. I don't know if I've ever really asked that question. <laughs> you know, do you do you really wish you hadn't done this? Right. I mean, do you wish you hadn't tried for something you didn't get? It'd right. be an interesting. Well, it's interesting. Be an interesting research. Yeah, uh, they've done question. studies at the end of life, and the biggest regret that most people have is what they didn't do. 
Exactly. And that came to mind too. The things you don't do. Yeah. You don't trying for things that you don't get. That's, that's a good thing, you know? Yeah. At least, you, at least you didn't, you know, say, well, I'm not going to do it. Right. And people do, do regret that. And that's part of what, uh, interested me in eventually when I transitioned to creativity is, you know, that I feel that, uh, with all of the pain and, you know, suffering that goes with, uh, entertainment business. And there's plenty of that. Um, I got something from the experience I couldn't get, uh, I couldn't put a price on in terms of, um, understanding more about life, entertaining people, um, enlightening in some cases myself and other people. Um, you know, so the good was so good that you, you know, you say, well, the stuff that didn't work, it's, it's, it's a privilege to have been a part of Mm -hmm. something that reached so many of the people. Shit, more, more everybody in America. You know, exactly. Virtually. Yeah. And I recently watched that documentary that came out about her and about the show. Oh, yeah. And I'm curious, just what was it like to be in that environment and to work on that show? Well, that that documentary, I, I you know, presented the feminine side of yeah. The, yeah. There, were, there weren't a lot of women involved when I was there. Truthfully. Right. Yeah. There were, yeah. you know. They did write 20, whatever number of percent of the scripts was higher than any other show. Mm -hmm. But frankly, women were not, were not there that much. Um, It was, um, it was easy. And I, I turned down a staff position on that show. That's one of the regrets I had. Mm. How come? Things. Because I had the experience on room 222 was terrible. Mm. I mean, they left. To do Mary Tyler Moore. Yeah. I was in alone with no experience writing for a national audience. Yeah. I was, you know, frankly, I didn't like it. I, I didn't think it was a way to to work, even though, it, I mean, shows do that. All mm-hmm. the family, Norman Lear did it. He tore up the show every week. And that would, that wasn't my way of working. It was too... I mean, I'm getting my stomach's churning just from talking about it. Oh gosh, so, yeah. So, uh, that um, I didn't. I I thought I might be in that position again as the only. There weren't weren't big staffs then. There yeah. wasn't even a lawyer in the first year. So I thought I'm going to be in that room and I'm going to be miserable trying to do this stuff and it it's going to not going to work for me. Hmm. So, I mean, it was a logical decision. Yeah. So, but, you know, you made the decision based on the information you had at the time, right? And yeah. and then you yeah. eventually pivoted to academia. So how did you decide to make that shift into then studying creativity? Well, we're going to do a dissolve. <laughs> okay. Because this, this is like, <laughs> this is like 25 years later. <laughs> It wasn't like, oh, I'm not going to be a story. I'll go work in academia. So you kind of worked. You I worked played through it, your whole I played it TV out in career. show business for. Yeah. I think it was twenty, twenty two, twenty three years at least. Yeah. That I was doing it. So you age out in that business, mm-hmm. most people. And I was the oldest person in the room mm-hmm. there for the last five to ten years. Yeah. So at that point, you know, you're kind of. It's clear you're, you know, you're not going to be the oldest person in the room mm-hmm. into your fifties, right? So, uh, I had gone to around fifty, and uh, it wasn't instantaneous. It was a slow um, process uh, in which I didn't know what I was going to do next. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't want to just take what I had and go try to live the rest of my life on that. Uh, I wanted some another challenge or another thing that interested me, and um, I was I started teaching at UCLA Extension mm-hmm. um, almost immediately. 
so teaching did crop up as something I was doing. Yeah. And I enjoyed it. And um, I didn't know, I didn't want to just teach writing, though. I didn't feel that was what I wanted to do. And uh, the term creativity popped up in a class I was taking at UCLA. If you teach, you can take free class. So I was taking these random classes. Yeah. And I thought about consulting on create, you know, things like that. But I, because I had been a business major, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't, it didn't ring any more appealing to me. Ultimately, I got stationary printed. I didn't want to sell it. I didn't want to do it. Yeah. And so, um, I mean, I did a couple of seminars for business, big business companies that mm -hmm. paid well. Mm -hmm. But um, I didn't think the people that uh, worked there really wanted wanted that. Um, they they were you know salesmen who wanted to be out selling. And they didn't have any interest in listening to some anybody. Well, I didn't take it personally. It's just yeah. they didn't want it. They, they weren't in the market for for that. They mm -hmm. didn't feel they needed it. They thought they were already the most creative people in the world. Right. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, the term creativity came up, and I I didn't know anything about it. So I I had. Something I didn't mention, though, was in the middle of my career when I could see that I wasn't going to like want to do this or sustain this for, a, you know, a longer time. Yeah. I, I stopped and got a master's degree in psychology. Okay. So I had that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I was going to maybe be a therapist or, mm -hmm. you know, work with writers. Uh, but then when it came to the time, even though I could have done it, I, I didn't want to do it. Yeah. So following the idea that I I shouldn't do anything I don't want to do. I was really spoiled brat. At this point. <laughs> but you, you were know, also like, following I'm your intuition. Do I don't well, want to do that. I had to work on television shows. <laughs> to finance my PhD, I worked on a television show I didn't like. So I thought, well, I'm not going <laughs> to. I'm going to try something I really I'm excited about. And so when creativity popped up, I went to look at the research and I, uh, I found that it went like, it was like a, uh, a curve that went up and down mm. the amount of, by decade, it went up and went down and went up, went down. <coughs> <coughs> and when I looked in the early nineties, it had gone down. So I thought, well, Maybe it'll go up. And yeah. Then, I, <laughs> then uh, I'll, I'll follow a pattern. I see a pattern here. Yeah. And um, I looked into it, and I liked some of the stuff I read. Mm -hmm. And I realized it was kind of a a niche thing over, you know, it wasn't a big. But there was a division of APA, and there were there was a journal, and there were, you know, it was a thing. Uh, it wasn't a huge thing, but it was something that I was excited about learning more about mm -hmm. and being a part of. So I uh, uh, went to, turned out one of the guys uh, that um, was teaching at USC, Dennis Hosvar, had done some work in creativity. So I got my master's at USC. So I went down and talked to him and he was, yeah, he, you know, you can, you can do this. And, uh, and, and was well, there a particular I, aspect of creativity that intrigued you? I mean, having been a television writer or like what kind yeah, of drew you to the yeah, field? I, mean, I thought, well, ultimately that wasn't what I went in for, but ultimately my dissertation was on television situation, mm -hmm. comedy writing. Yeah. And I thought it was very interesting. A lot of people would look at it and nobody is from <laughs> few people looked at it. Right. <laughs> nobody took well, your advice. <laughs> nobody no well, it was it was about the shooting of one episode of a yeah. uh comedy. So I guess it was pretty specific mm -hmm. and uh 
but I uh, I didn't know exactly what I, I was going to do. I thought I'd probably want to teach if I could, mm-hmm. but I re- realized that I was, you know, uh, not in the typical person that gets a teaching job right. at the university. And that's, but that's what I wanted, especially when I started doing research. So how did you uh, find your way there? Well, I, uh, uh, again, synchronicity, luck, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Dennis Hosevar knew Mark Runco, uh-huh. um, who was at Fullerton at that point. And he, he said he has something every month or something. Why don't you get in touch? So I went down there and... Mark had this little group of people that just met to talk about creativity. And uh, he he was interested in the fact I was a writer in my history. And so I had an idea uh, about my second year in or third year uh, based on uh, my doing research at USC. I had gone to different libraries to get books on mm-hmm. creativity. Wasn't a, I was in the School of Education. My degree was in educational psychology. Mm-hmm. But in order to find some stuff, I had to go over to the engineering library. Right. The law library. And I was like, this, this is crazy because it's a field, but it isn't. I mean, it's scattered right. all over. It should be, should be centralized. So I had this idea for an encyclopedia of creativity. And one of the I originally thought it would be for the public, and I went over and talked to Mark about it and had lunch with him, and he said, yeah, that's good. You know, so now I had a guy who was the most published guy. <laughs> yeah, in the in field. The field. My, yeah. my co-writer, I mean, you know, that's, look at the synchronicity with that. Exactly. That's crazy, right? Someone knows and someone, so we, you get talking, yeah. and all of a sudden there's an encyclopedia of creativity. Talking. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just okay. We went to a publisher. We did get to an agent, uh, and um, he tried to sell it to the uh, to the public mm-hmm. and uh, to a publisher, mm-hmm. and they didn't buy it. And Mark and I were talking, and he said, well, what if we tried to do it as a, you know, a research for, you know, for people in education and business and stuff. And I said, well, let's give it a shot. Nothing's happening with this. Boom. We got two offers. He sent two people, two academic press in the Southern. And uh, um, we were able to get a pretty good deal for uh, educational publication. Yeah. And, uh, and it, uh, you know, got published. It got great reviews. It got published about the time I got my PhD. So, nice you know, work. I just barely got a PhD <laughs> on that. I'm, uh, and I mean, because, and uh, I had stuff published. I'm trying to get students now. I'm still teaching the writing class. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to get them to, you know, think a little bit more aggressively about getting publication. Yeah. Uh, but um, you need, you know, you find that somebody who can open the door for you, and if you're lucky, very lucky, they will do it. And uh, you know, uh, uh, Mark didn't do it for me; he did it for himself because he thought it was a good idea. Yeah. And uh, uh, but so you have to come in. You have to come in with something. Yeah, usually. but you had an idea, and and yeah, and he was open to I it. I didn't and... sit on. I didn't say, "Oh, I'm, that'd be a nice thing to have." Yeah, someday we will do it. I did it. And yeah, that's that's really what I think is important. And look at you. <laughs> you know, all well, the stuff you're doing. You're I was going to say, yeah, no. And I, you know, m- you and my other faculty at Saybrook really encouraged me to, to get out there and start publishing, turn my dissertation into a book. And, and I've yeah. been, I've taken that to heart, you know, but I was going to say, you know, in reference to your, 
your teaching career, you know, when I was looking around at programs and I was interested in psych- the psychology of creativity. And so Saybrook University has this somewhat unique program. And I remember when yeah. I was looking at the program and I, I spoke with you and I spoke with Ruth Richards um, and uh, – and also with Terry Goslin Jones, um, and she was an alum at the time. And um, but I remember the conversation with you. What really struck me because I said, you know, here I am, like I'm already out here in the work world. I'm I'm doing coaching, and I, you know, I have a career and all this, but I don't necessarily want to be a career academic. So what does one do with a degree in creativity studies? You know, and you said to me, you know. In the 21st century, we are going to need people who are experts in creativity, who understand creativity and how it can be used to address, you know, the complex problems of our time. And and that really struck me, you know, and at the end of the day, that's the that's the one program I ended up applying to, you know. Yeah, it was very I, I knew. A little bit of what I what I envisioned it and why I had gone into it. That mm-hmm. was very clear to me. And the the bottom line is that uh, it helps people. Um, it it's it's personal growth as well as yes accomplishment. And that's a great combination. Yes. Um, and I think that um, I was at a different stage in life at that point, and I had seen you know a a lot Mm -hmm. good and bad Mm -hmm. and uh i wanted to kind of pass on what had happened to me uh and get the benefit of making this uh something uh special yeah and seabrook had popped up because it's like one thing leads to another. I yes. had never heard of Seabrook. Right. N- and, neither had and I. <laughs> people who were on the board of the encyclopedia were Stanley Krippner and Ruth Richard. Mm-hmm. So I said, well, they're both at the Seabrook. What, what is, is Saybrook? this place? I looked, I looked it up and I went to, uh, again, I wasn't necessarily going to do this. A lot of this is synchronicity. There was a, a I was in Austin, Texas. Yeah, where, where you I are, am right it's now. Yeah, it's been a month, and I thought about living there, and uh, decided I wanted to live in the United States. Excuse me. <laughs> yes, understood. With everything there in Texas, state of Texas, Texas, Texas. I said, if that radio, if that guy says Texas again, I'm going <laughs> to smack. The radio. <laughs> They're very proud. <laughs> oh yeah, very proud in Texas. Uh, and the weather was a little hot, so. Uh, I was going to go to Colorado, and but I did my due diligence before. I loved to ski, that, and uh, I loved the mountains, and uh, but I went to the University of Denver where I had been a student briefly, and mm-hmm. I talked to the Department of Psychology. I went to the University of Colorado. I talked to they. They were like creativity. What? What? English, please. Right. English? What? What are you talking you know, about? We, we don't do that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I can see that. You know, right. <laughs> there's no creativity <laughs> in this department. Right. So, so um, I uh, I had to go back to L.A. for a dental thing. My daughter was there, and I drove from Texas. I wasn't planning to do this at all. I was planning to go to Colorado yeah. and live there. Yeah. And ship stuff there. <laughs> I went to L.A., and APA was in San Francisco. So I drove up to San Francisco. And a friend of mine had uh, a sister who I knew, who was also a friend, who said, I'm going away for two weeks, so use my apartment. I mean, all laid out for me and there you were so so i i went to a saybrook event and uh, i met ruth i met ruth i called ruth and i said who, who i was and what i and i met ruth and ruth is one of those people of course of course <laughs> yes. you can do this i said i want to 
walk across <laughs> the Pacific Ocean. To, of course, <laughs> of you, course can you can. <laughs> so, so she said, uh, why don't you get in touch with Maureen O'Hare? I also met Dennis Chaffee, who are both guest speaking in my class. Oh, nice. Years later. Nice. And, and uh, I went to see Maureen O'Hare, who was the president at that point, who took a who gave me an appointment, which is again, lucky, you know, mm -hmm. but, uh, and I went in and I just had the encyclopedia published and I, you know, showed her a copy and I said, I want to teach here because you're the place that gets creativity. Cause you got Ruth here. Right. And Ruth was really the doorkeeper in a way because it, she was this creativity expert. Mm -hmm. And I, a lot of people would say, no, I don't want anyone. <laughs> else you know, right. we don't need to well, i'm the right i'm an I'm in, territorial and she was open yeah territorial she mm -hmm. was wide yeah. open to my coming in and uh i talked about well maybe we could you know build a department build a, a specialization or you know some sort of a thing and uh maureen uh said you can work part time i'll give you the right now i didn't go in an interview and do a lot what people do you know right the, the like official it. process of course yeah, not because you're not creative <laughs> she just she just said okay go ahead you can start and you work there and about three months later so i decided i i'd live in san francisco I always liked it. It just didn't make any sense. Yeah. It was the first on my list when I started saying I wanted to leave LA. Yeah. Then the tech thing came and it's so expensive and it didn't make sense. And, uh, but I, I just committed to live there then in, in, instantly. And then there and you were. Yeah. Three months later, somebody left the department at the time that Ruth and I were in. And uh, Maureen said, I'm putting you on half time. You're going to chair that. So I'm I'm brand new. I'm chairing it. <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, and so then eventually it took, took years to get full time. Though. It took five more years, I think. Yeah. But at least. But um, uh, I got a part time job somewhere else. And, but you see, it all, I mean, it seems like. There's a lot of luck involved. Of course. In of life, course. You know? Right. Again, yeah. you know, it's like we can't necessarily foresee where the path is going to lead, particularly as creatives or people pursuing creative fields, you know. So then I think it becomes yeah. important to be able to sort of tap into that intuition and that and trust that sense of synchronicity, right? That and, one and conversation will lead to something and yeah and to go for it yeah yeah so i'm mindful of our time it, it's flown by and unfortunately we have to start wrapping up but i'm curious so you got to saybrook you're you know you're you're teaching you build the creativity program and i don't know this might be a hard question but over your years of teaching students and working with students around creativity is there a particular piece of advice you would give or or what's the most important thing that you've come to understand about creativity and the creative process um i think it's that not to not to categorize it yeah to recognize that everyone's creativity is um as unique as, as everyone is. Yes. And uh, so, some people have the ability to to stretch and grow. And uh, I, I feel uh, as a teacher, the only thing you do is give people the space to do that. And it's like uh, as a parent, you can't, uh, your kid will, have to find their way yes <laughs> you know you hopefully give them some things that um are useful for them and some understanding and some confidence and uh then it's really up to the individual uh to find to find a way uh to do it but and the ones 
that succeed uh, tend to take chances and go ahead and do it. They don't sit there waiting for someone to knock on the door right. because that I don't have any story about I'm sitting there and someone came along exactly. And, but hey, you uh, you want to you want to write a show? Right. You want to you want to be a professor? No, that doesn't happen. Uh, so taking charge of your life and being willing to to uh, to go for what you want. I I don't I don't think it's wise to take. Uh, I I don't think it's wise to take some of the risks I've done. I did I did a, a interview for a chapter uh, about my career, and I came out and I thought, well, you know, I ended up saying at the end, of it, don't, don't don't do, do what, what I, I did. did. <laughs> Because, right. I mean, it could have been, that, you can see the spots where it could have been, right. you know, I would be on the street. I mean, uh, it, right. it, uh, it's been a little bit reckless. And because the, the first thing of just moving to Hollywood and doing that at, you know, 24, which is already getting toward that 30 age when you're too old. Right. And, yeah. yeah. Theoretically. Uh and don't I, I think it's don't follow those rules either because you know, who knows? Right. I didn't see too many people past 30 make it in, but exactly. Uh, yeah. And most but, of the creative most creative people, the most creative people are not the ones who are following the rules, usually. Right? So you do have to yeah. take risks and sometimes they work out and sometimes they don't. That's right, and uh, the the that that's both the uh, good and bad part. I mean, exactly, you're in something where the uh, you know the personal stakes may be high because if it works out, you're you know uh, I've had now 25 years almost at Saybrook. Yeah, and um, I uh, I feel for. Uh, Second career, there couldn't have been anything that made me happier. Absolutely, and it didn't have the uh, didn't have the downside of the show. There, there was, you know, stuff, but uh, there's plenty of stuff. It's not always teaching, everywhere. <laughs> teaching isn't easy. And, yeah, and there's always stuff. Of but um, uh, I'm as I look back, I'm I'm happy. I had to two careers that were very interesting and uh and uh i f- i feel i feel happy about uh the life i left and and even you know i i one that goes has gone over the mistakes the could have would have i'm i've got a phd in that in my head yes you know i've got exactly. the maybe 5000 hours necessary right <laughs> right uh, and I could put the diploma on a wall. I can say, you know, uh, with with all of that, I I don't I don't regret any of it. I think it was it was really, uh, um, I can't. Some parts were fun. Some parts were painful. All of it is living life and that's what i think creativity the most important thing about a creative life it, you are engaged yes you aren't sitting around you are fully engaged in what you are doing exactly and that that uh, there's no substitute for that Mm-mm. there's no you are really living life at, at a, a pace you know i had that, that i mean 2 years of that going into the office and just hating every day uh, that, that, that is uh, not what I think most people want out of life. Indeed. I mean, there's nothing like working in an office to drive you into creativity. I had the same experience. Yeah. I mean, part of my, <laughs> so, part of the reason I didn't want to go to be a story editor, I did become a producer and I did go in yeah. years to shows, but, uh, you know, uh, some of that was really fun and some of it wasn't. But, sure. you know, you sit in a room with a lot of um, really funny people 
and uh, try to make jokes. And if it doesn't work, you've still got that time in that room. Exactly. And, it's the, uh, yeah, right. It's the process as much as yeah, anything else. Is, yeah. Process is, is great in, in terms of uh, teaching you whether you want to learn or not. Exactly. It'll teach you something. Exactly. You can't disengage. Right. You're, you know, you're, you're in life. You're and there. I that, yeah. That is why I would like to see that the next thing I'm really, uh, uh, excited about doing is seeing that knowledge. Some of the knowledge that I was so excited about learning has since in the last 25 years worked its way into the general Absolutely. knowledge. Absolutely. And, and creativity is out there. It's everywhere. It's a buzzword right. now, right? Yeah. Not so obscure. Yeah. So, yeah. so I feel yeah. uh, there's still, you know, a lot of work to do and, and getting it down into the educational system at the uh, high school and yes. grammar school and yes. level. Uh, and there was just a bill passed in California that you can have to have a, uh, they had cut the arts teachers, the yeah. education mm -hmm. and arts teachers and, and uh, arts and music. Yeah. And so it's happening. Somebody got a bill and they passed it and, and the funding is in part of the bill to have this. Now, that's yeah. going to make a huge difference yeah. in a lot of people's lives. Of course. You're talking about changing lives. Yeah, this is, this is the core of what psychology is all about. Yeah. So uh, as I see that and uh, uh, some of the other ways this is starting to influence uh, the educational system, uh, I think that that's uh, that's really important because if you can get into kids' heads that they can live a creative life, they can make their life creative, and it opens then, up so much more yeah, possibility. It can, go, it can go in unexpected directions. Absolutely, uh, lots of options. Uh, you know, lots of pitfalls, but but <laughs> you're fully in, engaged in life. Yeah, that's what. It, I love it. So I think that's a great note to end on. I'm so grateful to you for coming on this show today and for all of your mentorship over the years. Yeah. And if people want to learn more about you or or reach out to you, how can they find you, Steve? Um, well, my email is easy. It's spritzker at Saybrook. Okay. And we'll put it's that in the show notes. A dot edu. Okay. Uh, I don't have a website at this point. I should. Old I school. But, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <gasps> okay. Um, well, I no, I'm not I'm not old school. I'm just busy. I'm working on another website. Okay. Yeah, there you so go. Not, <laughs> I haven't had time to do mine. So. Okay. Fair enough. So thanks so much to Dr. Stephen Pritzker for being with us today. And at Syncreate, we're here to support your creative endeavors. So if you have an idea for a project or a new venture, please reach out to us for one on one coaching or join our Syncreate six month coaching group starting in April. And if you you say you heard about it here on the podcast we're offering a 10 percent discount on that you can find us at syncreate.org we're on youtube and all the podcast platforms as well as social media so find us and connect and we are recording today at record atx studios in austin in collaboration with mike osborne at 14th street studios and we've got Dr. Pritzker with us from California. Thanks again for being with us today. And we will see you next time.